When we talk about energy changes, we often refer to these changes taking place in a process. The word process is even in the title of this micro lecture. So, what exactly is a process? A process is any change in a system between an initial state and a final state. Of course, for it to be a change, the initial and final states must be different. Examples of processes include chemical reactions like combustion, precipitation, or acid-based neutralization. In all of these types of reactions, the system begins in some initial state, undergoes a chemical change, and ends up in some different final state. That's a process. Another example is dissolving a solute in a solvent. The initial state is the solute and solvent unmixed and separated. The final state is the solution. This is a process, a change from undissolved solute to dissolved solute. Other examples of processes include freezing of a liquid, boiling of a liquid, heating a solid on a laboratory hot plate, and physically lifting a beaker off a laboratory bench. These all represent changes between some initial condition and some final condition and can all be called processes. Why do we use the term process at all? Why not, for instance, specifically say reaction when we mean reaction? We use the term process to be as general as possible when talking about energy changes. Most of what we have to say about energy changes is true regardless of whether the thing that happens is a chemical, physical, or mechanical change. To avoid giving you the impression that something is true only for chemical reactions or only for a phase change, we use the word process to be general. If it helps, every time you see the word process, you are free to replace it with one of the specific examples on the right. So now let's talk about endothermic and exothermic processes and their effects. Let's imagine we have a system, such as the blue fluid in this beaker, in which something happens. If that something is an endothermic process, then the process in the system requires an energy input. We know that energy must come from the surroundings because of the first law. The energy input makes the final state energy of the system greater than the energy of the initial state, meaning that the system energy increases during the process. Experimentally, you will find that as the endothermic process takes place, the temperature of the system goes down, and then the temperature of the container follows suit, causing it to feel cooler to your touch. These statements and observations are all true, but sometimes you might be inclined to say, hang on, these things don't make sense. How can it be true, for instance, that the energy of the system increases, but the temperature goes down? Those things seem contradictory. At the same time, it makes sense that you would perceive the temperature of the beaker to go down because energy leaves the beaker and your hand, which are part of the surroundings, to enter the system as the endothermic process takes place. It turns out there really isn't a contradiction, just an appearance of one. We'll have to come back to that, but for now, let's look at an exothermic process. Let's imagine we have a system, again, such as the blue fluid in this beaker, in which something happens. If that something is an exothermic process, then the process in the system releases energy. We know that energy enters the surroundings because of the first law. The energy released by the system makes the final state energy of the system less than the energy of the initial state, meaning that the system energy decreases during the process. Experimentally, you will find that as the exothermic process takes place, the temperature of the system goes up, and then the temperature of the container follows suit, causing it to feel warmer to your touch. There's an apparent contradiction here as well. How can it be true that the energy of the system decreases, but the temperature goes up? On the other hand, it makes sense that you would perceive the temperature of the beaker to go up because energy enters the beaker and then your hand, which are both part of the surroundings, when it leaves the system as the exothermic process takes place. Again, this just appears to be a contradiction, not an actual contradiction. Let's see if we can clear this up. Let's start by putting up everything we just said about endothermic processes. What I want to focus on first is the bit about energy entering from the surroundings. That is true in an endothermic process, but you have to remember that energy flow is not instantaneous. Depending on how well insulated the container is, it can be quite slow for energy to enter from the surroundings to supply the needs of the endothermic process. In the meantime, the process takes place requiring energy input, and that energy comes from the nearest source, which is other parts of the system, such as water molecules in an aqueous solution. As the endothermic process takes place, the kinetic energy of the system's particles decreases, which causes the system temperature to drop. The container follows suit, decreasing in temperature and consequently feeling cooler to your touch. In the long term, all that energy that was taken from the kinetic energy of the system's particles will be returned as energy enters from the surroundings, but that could take a while. In the meantime, the system and its container feel cooler to your touch. So in thinking about this, you need to distinguish what is observed in the short term from what is observed in the long term. When an endothermic process takes place, energy is required for the process to take place, and in the short term, that energy will come from the system, causing the temperature of the system to decrease and the container to feel cooler. In the long term, all that energy will be replaced placed as it flows in from the surroundings. In the long term, the system temperature will return to its initial value, and the system energy will then be greater than it was before. It is important to remember to distinguish short-term observations from the long-term outcome. Now let's see if we can clarify the observations for an exothermic process. 
We'll start again by showing everything we have already stated about exothermic processes. Let's focus on the bit about energy leaving the system and entering the surroundings. That's true in an exothermic process, but again you have to remember that energy flow is not instantaneous. Depending on how well insulated the container is, it can be quite slow for energy to leave the system. In the meantime, as the exothermic process takes place, releasing energy, the energy enters the nearest location, which is parts of the system, such as water molecules in an aqueous solution. As the exothermic process takes place, the kinetic energy of the system's particles increases, which first causes the system temperature to increase. The container follows suit as energetic water molecules collide with the container walls, causing it to feel warmer to your touch. In the long term, all that energy will eventually leave the system, but that could take a while, depending on how well insulated the container is. In the meantime, the system and its container feel warmer. Just like for an endothermic process, you need to distinguish what is observed in the short term from what is observed in the long term. When an exothermic process takes place, energy is released as the process takes place, and in the short term that energy will be deposited in parts of the system, causing the temperature of the system to increase and the container to feel warmer. In the long term, all that energy will flow out of the system into the surroundings. In the long term, the system temperature will return to its initial value and the system energy will then be less than it was before. Again, always remember to distinguish with short-term observations from the long-term outcome. That's a lot of words for describing something that's really quite simple. As you might expect, practicing chemists have a more compact way to express all of this. Let's look at this language for an endothermic process. As we know, an endothermic process is one that requires the input of energy. In this situation, a chemist would say two things to imply everything we have talked about. The chemist would say that the container is diathermal and that at constant temperature, the final energy of the system is greater than the initial energy. Of course, the word diathermal is new. What does it mean for container walls to be diathermal? If container walls are diathermal, they allow energy to flow across them. It's sort of the opposite of insulating, although there is a technical word for that too that we won't talk about right now. Obviously, energy cannot enter from the surroundings if the container does not allow that. Saying that the container is diathermal means that it is possible for energy to flow in from the surroundings, which means it is possible for the temperature to be the same at the start and end of the process. If it does remain the same, then an energy input means that the energy of the system increases, just as we have learned. Keep in mind, this is all about the long term, what happens when sufficient time has passed. In the short term, every chemist will just know and assume that energy cannot flow instantaneously and that because of that, the temperature of the system will decrease until enough energy can flow in from the surroundings to return the temperature to its original value, making temperature constant. In other words, the short term effects are inferred. In the long term, in a diathermal container, the temperature of the system will remain constant. In an endothermic process, energy will flow into the system, and in an exothermic process, energy will flow out of the system to make that possible. In the short term, the system temperature changes because energy cannot flow in or out of the system infinitely fast. The effect is that in an endothermic process, the system temperature decreases, and in an exothermic process, the system temperature goes up. And that's effects of endothermic and exothermic processes.